Well, good morning again. You know, um, normally I will be, if I will be preaching, I would be getting up uh, around 11.45, 11.50. It's not even 11.30. That, that means that I have an hour and 15 minutes to speak. <laughs> don't worry, I don't know how to talk that long. Even if I try, uh, I don't think you will be able to uh, stand it. Uh, you probably will leave me here talking by myself. Um, but it is wonderful. I, uh, gosh, I miss the kids. Uh, I, I, miss, I miss everyone here. But also, I, uh, I'm very happy that all of you guys are here. To be honest, I thought it was going to be less people here, even less people here today. So we have a half full building. I think that that's pretty good, considering that over 45, 50 people, maybe more, are out there. <laughs> and some are also on vacation, so it's, it's great. It is great. I want to talk today about a topic that actually we have been talking about in uh, the Sabbath school, righteousness. And I want to start talking about righteousness on the way that I learned about it for the first time. I remember vividly, vividly, the first time I heard about righteousness. And it is important to, to say it vividly because the first time I heard about, uh, about righteousness and about us being righteous people, I was about seven years old. It was uh, a fairly large church near my hometown. It was a church, you know, I grew up in a very small church. And you know that uh, uh, the, the places where you have small churches, well, mo most likely you will be a part of a district, right? We have uh, two, three, four churches. Uh, as a pastor once, I had five churches uh, uh, at once for a couple of years. This church, uh, it was the, the larger church of the district. It was not the church that, the one, the church that I belonged to. My church was a smaller church. But the pastor decided that he wanted to do a revelation seminar. Um, that was back in the 80s. So you know the, the seminar that I'm talking about. Uh, I think the one that comes out of King, Texas. If I, if, I, think, I think that, I, get that I got that detail correctly. And the pastor was talking about righteousness. And I remember that uh, the first time that I ever heard that word is, uh, was when he read from Revelation chapter 22, verses, which, which verses? You know which verses? Oh, I thought you were saying. Every, every Seventh-day Adventist quote this like by heart. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. And there the pastor started talking and explaining. Now remember, this is a seven-year-old kid listening to what the pastor is saying. And I don't remember, I cannot tell you exactly all the words he said, but I can tell you what I remember hearing. I remember hearing that for me to be able to go to heaven, I must be righteous. Which I don't disagree with that. But I also remember hearing him say that I must become sinless. I shouldn't commit any sins. You can go to the next slide, actually. I shouldn't commit any sins. And I also remember him saying that if I ever committed a sin, I must make sure that I would confess every sin before I went to sleep. Gosh, seven years old, 
and I am told that I cannot commit any sins. To begin with, as a seven years old, I, I don't even understand the concept of sin. I knew what were some of the things that were a little naughty, right? But I didn't know what sin exactly was. And then I'm told you have to confess every single sin every night because, God forbid, you die that night and you forgot to confess that sin. You are not going to heaven. Now imagine the impact that such a thought will have in the mind of a seven, seven years old. Kid. And it doesn't stop there. Got that in my mind. And I'm sharing this with you because I know that even as adults, there are people that believe this way. Now, I just kept growing up, I grew up in the church. I grew up active in church. I grew up at 14, age 14, I was, I was a head deacon. Age 17, I was head elder. And here I am growing in church and trying to keep or trying to be a righteous kid trying to do everything right, and trying to confess my sins every single night. I don't think I have to tell you that that was a torture for a teenager. I went to college. And as a matter of fact, I didn't go to study theology or to become a pastor right away, although it was the desires of my heart, and I felt the calling of God from a very young age. I didn't go to college directly when I finished high school because I was not righteous enough to be a pastor. I spent my first two years in college studying psychology. Hated it. I couldn't stand it. 4.0. But I hated it with all my life. And after two years in college, I realized that through all those years, I misunderstood the concept of righteousness. And I misunderstood for a few reasons. Reason number one, probably I, didn't, I was not as diligent as I should have been in the study of the scripture. So that's on me. Reason number two also is that I was taught about righteousness outside of a context. And when we talk about righteousness, we must talk about righteousness on the context of faith and grace. Because if we take righteousness on its own, especially for us as human beings, righteousness is such a dry concept. You know what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? If I try to think about righteousness and the need for me to be a righteous person on my own, I will tell you what my life was back then. I have a miserable childhood, miserable teenager years because I was struggling mightily to become righteous, to be a righteous kid, to be a good kid. But you know what has done that to me? Now as an adult, I will confess 
with something that I still struggle today. I still struggle, and I know it's not true, and I have to talk me out of that every time. But because of that concept of righteousness, I still struggle with a thought that tells me all the time that I am not good enough. That I have to prove myself. That I have to show others how good I am. But I praise the Lord because that big mountain that was so hard and difficult to climb is being removed through faith by the grace of Jesus Christ. I can praise the Lord because there is hope for me. I can praise the Lord because there is a great message of salvation, also a great message of grace, and also a great message of righteousness that make me happy because righteousness is not what I have heard. Because righteousness is not what some of us have thought about it. And I certainly, uh, I'm intent today, my intent today is to try to explain and to try to get a better view of what is righteousness. and What it does imply, imply to be a righteous person. Today, I want to go through two Bible verses or two passages of the Bible. The first one will be uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And the, sec the second one will be, oh boy, I don't think you can read that, can you? I can't. <laughs> okay. And the second one will be Jeremiah chapter 23, verses uh, uh, 5 and 6. I guess I'm going to read it from here, and I hope you have your Bibles, because I don't think you can see that. And I want to start, and I want, we are going to spend most of the time in Romans chapter 5, and then we go, uh, as we are winding down, we're going to go to uh, Jeremiah 23. And uh, Romans chapter 5, verses uh, 1 through 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces, produces character, and char character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Being justified. We can go to the next one. Being justified. The first thing that we need to understand of this verse of being is is how it begins. It begins with therefore, right? Chapter 5 starts with therefore. And when, it starts, when, when something starts with therefore, it's because it is connecting what Paul, Paul is connecting what he's about to say with, with, with that that he has said already, right? So the first three chapters of, uh, of four chapters of Romans, Paul is talking about faith. And he's talking about grace. And he's talking about how Abraham was justified by faith because he believed God. So now Paul starts talking about what it means to be justified. And then he said, since we have been justified, we have been justified. And this is a very important element that we need to understand. We have been justified. In which tense do we find this expression? Which tense? Come on, you, you, you should know grammar better than I, English grammar better than mine, than I. I. English is not my first language, as you might have known. 
Being just, what tense? Past tense. Meaning that justification in us happened at some point, right? Now, let, let me make a disclaimer here. I'm not, I am not saying that once I am justified, I will be justified for the rest of the life. There are things that need to happen, okay? So let me make that disclaimer right away before somebody shut down <laughs> and said, I'm not going to listen to him anymore. But justification for the Christian in the Christian life is something that happens at some point in the past. And the thing is that the way is written in English, not only in English, not only the translation, but also in Greek implies that it's something that is completed. So if you are a Christian, if you have come to Christ, if you have been justified, you have you shouldn't have any concerns about your standing on front of God. You should not have any concerns about you being on, presen on the presence of the Creator. Why? Because to be justified means to be made right on front of God. Being justified means to be clear that we are in the right with God. With God. You know, I, I love the way that uh, the, the Adventist commentary says, it's, it says, it means the cancellation of the charges standing against us in God's court. That is what is to be justified. When we receive justification, we are made righteous. Righteous. We receive righteousness. We can stand in front of God because, not because we deserve it, but we can stand in front of God because God himself has canceled our debt. I, I, I can't tell you, I grew up with my dad. My dad, he was a mechanic. Of course I grew up with my dad. Well, some have not. But <laughs> my dad was a mechanic. And something that he used to, to do was every time my car broke down, he would fix it but I would have to pay him for fixing the car. And it was, I, I was a high schooler, and he would fix my car, and he would have to pay for the job. All right? Anything he will fix for me, I will have to pay for the job. And that <laughs> used to drive me crazy. But also, um, I used not to pay him anything. He would charge me, but I never wrote a check. I didn't have a way to write a check. One day, I asked him that, why are you charging me every time you fix my car? He said, well, I had a plan. My plan was, every time you pay me, I will put that money aside, and I will buy you a better car when you go to college. <laughs> but since you never pay me, well, you get what you get, and that's what you get. But you know what happened? My, my dad couldn't, that, couldn't do that to me. It was time to go to college. And he went, with the struggles and a lot of sacrifice. He canceled my debt. He went and bought me a car. That's exactly what it means. It means that what I owe is not taken into consideration anymore. That is righteousness when we receive it from God. That is to be righteous. That is to become righteous. Is that my guilt does not owe me anymore. That is to be righteous. We need to understand that this justification happens by faith. Okay? Justified by faith 
Justification only can happen, or righteousness, or being made right in front of God only happens by faith. There is nothing you can do about it. There is nothing I can do about it. I can struggle. I can intend. I can try. But doesn't matter how hard I try, doesn't matter how hard I, I go, I will never acquire righteousness in front of God, not on my own. It is like, you know, I, I love the, the, an illustration that Max Lucado makes about this. It says, righteousness is like jumping high enough like to reach the moon. Some of us may jump a little higher. And some of us will make fun of others for the little jump you have done. But at the end of the day, none of us will be able to reach the moon with a jump, could we? We are justified by faith. Now, let's not take this lightly. Some people say or think that faith is to believe. Is that right? Is that right? Is that or not? It is. But it's part of it only. To believe. Faith is not just to ascend that Jesus died for me and that he is my Savior. It's not the intellectual understanding of Jesus as a Redeemer. Faith demands relationship. Faith demands relationship. And what happened as I get to relate to Jesus? What happens as I get to relate to Jesus is that I get to know him. Right? And as I get to know him, then, you know what happened? Jesus is so, so great and so wonderful and so beautiful that as you get to know Jesus, there is no other choice but, but to get to love him. To get to love him. And when you get to love him, and only then when you get to love him, you are able to obey him. I, I illustrate it this way. When I was, uh, before I dated my wife, I, was, I wasn't dating anybody. I, it was okay for me to date anybody who will dare to, their, to, to date me. <laughs> I, did, I struggled a little bit getting someone to, da to date me. But I, I, at the end, I'm, I'm happy because I got the right one. But I was allowed to, you know, if I wanted to go out for dinner with a girl, I could invite it or, or whatever. Uh, I could invite anybody, right? Even as I met my wife, or while we were not dating, we were not together, I was still getting to know her. I, can't, I was kind of uh, free to date somebody else, you know, because we're, we were not really together. We, but I started to relate to her. I started walking with her. I started talking to her. Sometimes she said that too much. Uh, you know, I started calling her. I, I, I left the school to go to work, and then I will come back. I will hurry. I will rush back before they close the dorm so I will be able to see her before going to sleep. As I started relating to her, you know, at the beginning, I started, I, 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 I started to get in love, fall in love with her. And you know what? Almost 30 years later, I'm still obedient to her. <laughs> That's what happened when you fall in love with Jesus. So we need to understand that righteousness happened in our lives, but it only happens by faith. By faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
And the results for us as we have this righteousness in our lives, our, uh, it, it is peace. Justified by faith, we have, uh, by faith through Jesus Christ, or we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is something that also we need to understand because uh, being justified is more than just receive or being pardoned or forgiven. How many people in this world have been forgiven? How many? I, I love the fact that somebody raised their hand saying, me. <laughs> we have been forgiven. All, all, everybody in this world is being forgiven. When Christ died on the cross, he died on the cross to forgive the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever is believes in him should not perish. So he gave his son to forgive our sins. We all are forgiven. But being justified is not only to be forgiven, but it's also to receive the forgiveness. Otherwise, we will have no peace. Otherwise, we will not be happy. Because as we have received forgiven, but we have not accepted that forgiveness, the problem we encounter is that the guilt will ground us, will embarrass us, and will make us feel undeserving. We are justified. Therefore, we have peace with God meaning that we have access in hope to God's glory. When we, when we go back in, in chapter 3, verse 23, and verses, uh, verses 23 to 25, we find something very interesting. It says, because all of them have sin, they are all, and I'm paraphrasing, I, I'm, using, I'm using my version, J-R-M version. We all have been kicked out of His glory. But because we have been justified by faith through Jesus Christ, we now rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And you know what? It is interesting because I, I, the Greek says we can now boast. We can brag that we are. But not because of what we have done, but what he has done for us. Being justified by faith, we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Also, we can rejoice in suffering. Why can we rejoice in suffering? One more click. Because our suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character gives us hope. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. I promise that I'm getting almost done. We rejoice because we need to remember first that being justified does not mean that we are not going to suffer anymore doesn't mean that we are not going to have any more problems. Actually, the Bible nowhere promised us that we are not going to suffer. Jesus promised the contrary, that we will, have, will be persecuted. We will have all type of tri tribulations and, and trials. Neither we rejoice in suffering because we enjoy to suffer. You know, nobody here is a masochist, I, 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 I hope. We don't enjoy suffering. We don't want to suffer. But we rejoice in suffering because in trials and tribulations, we can see proof after proof of God's power in our weakness. We can see proof after proof of God's providence when we suffer. And we can see consistently God's power. But through suffering, our character develops. Now let's put it this way. Through suffering, we are being sanctified. We grow spiritually. 
we are being sanctified. By the way, you know what, which other way Jesus describes the process of justification? You don't know? What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must, you must be born again. Sanctification is the new birth. Uh, I mean, justification is the new birth. Sanctification is the baby growing up. That's simple. That's the best way to explain it for me. You were born as a baby, and the process of sanctification, you are growing up. And as you face trials and tribulations, as you suffer, as you are uh, struggling in life, God is by you helping you to grow, helping you to move forward and to grow in character. Now let me ask you something. Will you make the same mistakes? Well, some people do. <laughs> Will you make the same mistake you made 20 years ago? Hopefully you don't. Sometimes we do. Kids do that. It's a process. And as we are developing, we are getting stronger and stronger. Year after year, day after day, trial after trial, we grow stronger. We develop endurance. And that endurance helps us to develop our character. The fire of proof, the fire of trials, as Peter chapter 1 says, is what gives us the growth that we need. It's what purified us. Then we are being purified, we are being restored to the image of God. When we are justified, we have been made right on the presence of God. We have been forgiven, we have been, uh, everything has been forgotten, and God treats us as we have never sinned. And as we are facing trials, as we are facing tribulations, we are growing spiritually step by step. And our character has been developed. But when our character will be completely developed? The day when Jesus Christ comes and takes us to heaven. That's when, we are, that's when our character will be completed and will be fully perfect. When we go to heaven because we know that the one that started the good work in us will be faithful to finish it until the day of the Lord. So God is working in our character, in our lives. He's been working in our lives since the time we received him by faith and he will keep working in us until the day we go to heaven. And I don't know, I think he will still work it. When I look at my life and I saw so many, see so many imperfections, I don't know, he will need eternity to fix it. But thanks God because His grace is enough. And that it gives us hope. A hope that does not disappoint. A hope that is based in God's love. Think about this. First, I have been justified, not because I love God, not because of my abilities, not because of my strength. I have been justified because God loved me. You are justified because God loves you. There is nothing around. There is no more around. You have been justified through the grace of Jesus Christ. Not because of what you have done, but because of what he did and what he does. Because he loves you. Because he loves me. As a matter of fact, if I could justify myself, if I could justify myself by obedience, Jesus wouldn't have to come and die for my sins ever. It would have been a waste of time, a waste of blood, and a waste of suffering. I can be justified only and only because God loves me.
because of that love that has been poured into my heart and into your heart by the Holy Spirit. That's how justification and sanctification keeps going. Because of the Holy Spirit has come. When the Holy Spirit comes into my life, I have the blessed hope. Bless the hope that does not disappoint. And what is that hope? That hope. Titus speaks about it. Or Paul speaks about it in Titus. What is the blessed hope? Oh, come on. What is the blessed hope? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Check how Paul starts in justification and take us all the way down. And I can't, I, I, I don't know why, but I think there is a correlation between justification, sanctification, and the complete of the work of God in my heart, in my life when Christ comes. The blessed hope. And what will happen when that blessed hope takes place? Jeremiah chapter 23, and I will have to read it again. I need to get more practice in these things of making presentations. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. says right there, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In these days, Judah, the people of God, will be saved and Israel we dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Who is our righteousness? When Jeremiah is talking here, I have to admit that to some extent he's talking about the people of Judah. To be restored and being brought back to Jerusalem. But also if we go through the context of Jeremiah, we figure that the prophecy of Jeremiah tells the people of Judah that it's not going to be until 70 years before they go back. Meaning that those that arrive to Babylon age 5 most likely will not go back to Jerusalem. Most likely will be too old to go back to Jerusalem. Therefore, I have to imagine that Jeremiah is also talking, as every other prophet in the Bible might be talking about a temporal, present fulfillment, but most likely he's talking about the time in which God will establish his kingdom. When God will establish once and for all his kingdom and sin will be eradicated from, from this universe. Our hope. And I will tell you my hope today. My biggest frustration in life has been that I have never been enough. My biggest frustration in life is being that I have never been cut off to do my best or to do great. And I don't know if you're experienced, but many of us have experienced in places when we go, people telling you how great you could be but very seldom you are told how great you are doing. (laughs) 
And although my biggest frustration is being that I've never been and I will never be good enough, my greatest hope is that I don't need to be great enough. My greatest hope is that I don't have to be perfect. My greatest hope is that perfection was acquired by Jesus and Jesus imputed His perfection in my life. My greatest hope and what gets me rest is to know that by grace I have, I have access to His righteousness and I can reclaim it any time, any day, any night. My greatest hope, my greatest hope is that I can have the presence of Jesus Christ in my heart. My greatest hope that is that with Jesus Christ on my heart, I will be able to obey His commandments. But also, when I messed up, which is more times than what I like to admit, also when I messed up, because Jesus is in my heart, my sins are forgiven. And I don't have to struggle anymore. I don't have to try to convince anybody or anyone on how good I could be and how righteous I am. As a matter of fact, I proudly say I am a sinner, but I have a sinner that, I, that he, has, he has been forgiven. Today, if you struggle with the same things, Today is the time to ask Jesus into your heart once again. Because having Jesus in your heart, that, my brothers and sisters, that is true hope. That is true hope. And that, that is true righteousness. Reclaim His righteousness. Reclaim His presence in your heart. Our Lord, our Father, thank You. Thank You because although we are sinners, and You are with us and You still loved us. Thank You because You have provided reconciliation through Jesus with You. And thank You because we have not to carry anymore the burden of sin, the burden of guilt in our backs because Christ took it away on the cross of Calvary. Father, we reclaim your righteousness today knowing that it is by faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.